we 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 do face uh, um, a systemic turmoil, and I will try to elaborate um, on that. I will try to be analytical and also prescriptive because uh, Ina asked us also to try to give some, um, even if it's not solutions, maybe some uh, ways to try to, to, to progress. And I will do that seated as a think tanker. Uh, so I'm the director of uh, IFRI, French Institute for International Relations, which is a think tank. And our job is precisely to try to uh, produce an expertise which should be useful for uh, decision makers. I, I, will, I will be back on that. Let me start with um, a paradox we are facing in the think tank industry at the time being, which is related to the evolution of the political situation. We are doing a lot to try to disseminate our research, to try to address new audiences, and not only the so-called uh, uh, elites. And this effort, which is visible in the many, many think tanks uh, worldwide, uh, coincides uh, with a much more higher of a public skepticism, or a much more higher of critics coming from prominent politicians on expertise. So that means two things. Maybe we are very bad at doing our job which is uh, all the time something which should be considered. Or maybe there is some for, uh, something deeper, which is the evolution of the relation between expertise and uh, politicians. And personally, I do believe that's the second option, even if I try to make some efforts to, to improve uh, our production on a day-to-day -day basis. But we are facing a very particular moment in which the simple fact of you know uh, listing some problems or elaborating about a situation uh, can be very strongly criticized through social media through some different embassies in our respective capitals through some uh, group of interest and so on so I start with that because I think it's a challenge for all of us to try to defend the notion of expertise based on facts and data and not on opinion or not on a sort of uh, advocacy uh, approach. The second problem we are facing, it is the fact that we are facing manipulation of information made very seriously by some states, which also some uh, electoral interference in our uh, system, for instance, in France, during the last uh, presidential election in March 2017. So it's also a problem for the think tankers, for the think tanks, because they are supposed to analyze, but sometimes they are also targeted to disseminate uh, a message uh, motivated by some uh, agencies or some uh, governments. So it's an evolution of um, our job. I, I wanted to start with um, with it. Despite this, um, these difficulties, I do think that analysis based on facts and various contacts are very, very important for the political debates at different levels. Local level, for instance, in the cities, uh, at the national levels, because all main elections are still organized at this level, at the European level, obviously, because we are uh, preparing the next uh, election for the European Parliament in next uh, May, which is certainly a very important uh, time. And at the international level, the think tanks industry is a way to have these contacts, even if uh, the situation between some countries, for instance, between uh, Russia and Ukraine, are uh, very critical. Um, I will try to to elaborate my, my presentation with nine very brief points before uh, maybe a, a, a very also brief conclusion. The, the, the point from one to, to three will be to describe the main characteristic of the global disorder of the time being. The point from, the point from four to, to, to six will be much more focused on the power politics which is uh, something 
in, 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 in my view, which is transforming very quickly the international system. And I will uh, finish with three points to try to, to make some suggestions for the, for the think tank industry in this regard. So let me, let me start with the three main characteristics. Obviously, it's, it's very simplistic, but it's a way to start the discussion. First, I think we are facing a world which is less poor, but which is more unequal. Um, the so-called globalization, uh, it was a way to extract from poverty approximately one billion of inhabitants, which is remarkable. But at the same time, it creates a global inequality, which is also um, impressive. One percent of the worldwide population owns approximately 43% uh, percent of the global wealth. So this inequality is, in my view, um, uh, something uh, very, very difficult to be, to be addressed. It explains also a sort of wave of privatization, which can be uh, the key word to describe what started you know, after the uh, collapse of the USSR until, I would say, the 2008 uh, financial crisis. But this privatization has some global privatization has some deep consequences in terms, for instance, of fiscal evasion or in terms of the evolution of our educational systems. Just uh, a brief note on that. Have a look on, on the situation of the uh, education system in the UK and in the US, and maybe you can have some explanation for what happened uh, with the Brexit or with um, the election of Donald Trump. Um, second point, we are facing a world which is limited in terms of uh, natural resources, but which is quite unlimited in terms of access, in terms of uh, uh, individual uh, access. It is very often said that, you know, data, for instance, is in your oil in terms of um, uh, economic activity. I don't think so. I think it's... it's uh, it's uh, not a proper uh, comparison because oil, gas are limited resources and will be more and more uh, limited, um, whereas uh, data are completely unlimited. And the more we are speaking, the more we are traveling, the more we are working, the more we are producing data. So this notion of, of data, all the challenges related to that, is a very serious matter for all of us, especially for Europe, which is in a very uncomfortable position between the US and its very powerful platform and the coming China in, uh, in, in this regard. Point number three, um, we have a tension between technology which is seen, which is promoted namely as an individual way of empowerment and at the same time, we are also understanding, all of us, that it's becoming much more a system of global monitoring. Um, it is very visible already in China, and it is coming through, through that, you know, all the social credits, facial recognition, this sort of evolution. Just have a look about what is promoted by the Chinese authorities in terms of city governance at the time being. It's not only infrastructure, water, energy, and so on. I, we, we made a study on that in my institute in Africa, for instance, in some African cities, but also all the services to monitor the people. And it's completely integrated. So this tension between uh, individual liberty and the uh, global monitoring will be something on which we should um, be very, very uh, careful. Second part of his presentation, power politics. And to try to, to sum up things uh, on second, very, too briefly. First of all, the triangle between the US, China, and Russia. Why I, started, uh, I start with that? It is to say that these three countries, which are also three uh, permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, uh, are, at the time being, weakening multilateralism in different ways. Of course, for the U.S. it's different, and uh, the U.S. is the ally of uh, European countries, 
through uh, uh, NATO. We have this tradition of uh, 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 separation of powers. You have a very vib vibrant uh, civilian society, but you had all the decisions taken by the Trump administration withdraw from different uh, uh, agreements, and namely the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, also the uh, GCPOA, which was um, set up in July 2015 to stop Iranian nuclear program. And I can continue the list. At the time being, the Trump administration is no more the, the main uh, defender of the uh, international liberal order, but just want to become the primus inter pares and to have a sort of bilateral relation with uh, every um, uh, country in the world. For China, what does it mean in terms of um, uh, targeting and weakening uh, multilateralism? Have a look about you know the situation in China Sea. Uh, beginning of a politic uh, a policy, so we have sanctions against, for instance, uh, South Korea. Also, a, a policy which is related uh, economic investments and political support uh, uh, within the United Nations, for instance. And I can elaborate on that. And for Russia, of course, many examples of the uh, uh, attacks against multilateralism, annexation of Crimea, destabilization of Donbass, um, I, all the, the use of the veto for the Syrian crisis, uh, and so on. Part number five, the situation in Middle East. On that, I would, I, would, I, I would like to be back to 40 years ago, 1979, which is, in my view, the turning point for four main reasons. First of all, the beginning of the creation of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the beginning of the competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran to get the leadership of the Muslim world. Second, uh, the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, which seems something very far away now, given the evolution of Israel and the uh, collective inability to deal with the Palestinian uh, issue. Third, it was a siege at Beka, which was also the first expression of the so-called uh, radical jihadism. And fifth, uh, sorry, and four, it was the Soviet intervention in Afghanistan. Interesting to have these reminders in mind, because at that time, 1979, the USSR, Moscow, seemed very, very powerful, able to intervene in, in Afghanistan, also in Africa, Mozambique, Angola. And of course, you have all in mind what happened only nine years after. So you can appear very powerful at the time being, and very quickly also to see your system completely dismantled. Now the problem is in fact <coughs> the following. We are facing the failure of the so-called Arab Springs everywhere in the Middle East and in North Africa, except maybe in Tunisia. We do uh, expect the evolution, especially from uh, seated from, uh, from Paris in Algeria with the succession of uh, President Bouteflika, all big issues. And obviously, the end of the conflict in Syria uh, seems uh, to me, unfortunately, very unlikely. Point number six, uh, the uncertainties generated by Europe itself. Europe was seen as something very stable, very capable, having a project, and now it is seen as something very fragile, uh, having uh, a lot of uh, uncertainties for its uh, very next future. No need to mention Brexit, uh, the rise of uh, populism. I would like to stop off this notion, populism. Personally, and I would be glad to, to, to be challenged on that, I, I do think that a mistake which was made was not to listen to the results of the, vo the, the votes we had, especially in 2005. We had a no to the referendum organized in France and in the Netherlands, and in 2005, uh, Seven, 2008, uh, uh, I don't remember precisely, we had the uh, Lisbon Treaty. Vox Populi, Vox Dei, everywhere, also in Europe. And uh, it's, it can be explained to have this sort of uh, disconnect between the political elites and the opinion when we didn't respect to some extent the results of the votes we had uh, 
uh, 13 years ago. Other problem we are facing, it, it is terrorism, which is not new, which is, which is what is new, it is the fact that we have homegrown terrorists, which were educated by our system, which are all citizenship, or, or, or two citizenships, and we simply do want to provoke civilian uh, war in Europe, especially uh, in countries like the UK or France, for due to their colonial past, namely. And we are also, this big issue of migration, the fact that we are seen as, from the outside, are um, exclusive and not an inclusive area, and that the migration policy is more and more uh, delegated to some extent to third countries like Turkey, uh, Libya, Niger, and, and others. So the big issue for Europe from this point of view will be its ability to invent, to design uh, a relationship uh, workable with uh, African countries. Let me finish with the uh, three last points to what can be done by the think tank industry in this, um, in this context. And obviously, it will work at a completely different level. It's much more suggestion uh, to try to, to improve what can be done at our own level. First, I think that we should try to infuse political debates at the local, at the national, at the international level with analysis based on facts and not on opinions. I, I think we should be very clear on that. There are many, many so-called think tanks which are only promoted some advocacy approach. It's, it is less and less uh, research things, you know, paper you made after having been on the field, having made some interviews, having uh, read all the literature, but only, you know, opinions, reaction, tweets, things like that. Our industry should be, should re-become, I would say, more serious. And in that regard, we should be also very, very reluctant to any type of nationalism, which is unfortunately more and more promoted by some think tanks. Point number eight, there is a need, and that's uh, good news for think tanks, there is a need for big design and big thinking. What sort of international system we should think about in the future, given the fact that our uh, international liberal order will change, will be transformed by the transformation of the rapport de force between China and others. So what sort of system? It, it is um, uh, announcing. And there is, there is a lot of thinking which is um, needed, uh, especially coming uh, from, uh, from uh, Europe. I think also we should uh, act as a reminder to help the opinion, to help the politicians to understand the consequences of structural uh, changes and what does it mean to face a comeback of uh, balance of powers. We are a generation of politicians which is not necessarily aware about that. And I think that the role of the think tanks is to have this sort of memory in mind, to avoid, to repeat the mistakes of the past. And lastly, point number nine, maybe also try to be not too pessimistic, not to be only focused on risks, which, which is also a tendency in the think tank industry I would like to correct. Also to be able to be focused on positive changes, on positive transformation, because it's a way to engage the opinion and to address uh, new consistencies. So I will conclude very Briefly, to say that in the program there is a very good sentence in introduction. We are all different, but we are all citizens. So, from my point of view, what does it mean? It means to refuse to be citizens, it is to refuse to be simplistic and to, to work as citizens. To, to, we have the ability to get all the information we want, but uh, the paradox is that we are more and more with a sort of black and white position. So I think that to be a citizen, it's to refuse simplification, to control emotions, and uh, to accept the complexity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tamam. You said something that I really liked, that we all need to become 
much more serious again. Deficit of seriousness is something I, I, I feel every day at every step, not least in the UK, but, but not only in the UK, in, in most other places as well. Let's move on, let's move to, to Russia. Um, Denis, give us, give us your perspective. Um, Tomas said what think tanks can do, you can tell more from society's perspective or basically whatever is important. Uh, if I may uh, start by uh, saying that I'm, this is my first time at, at the Moscow School at, at the the association of the schools and so I do feel um, uh, challenged somewhat uh, but uh, I know many of you uh, and uh, I have um, closely followed uh, the work uh, of uh, the school for many years uh, so I do not uh, feel myself to be a stranger um, and when, uh, and as we were discussing um, the uh, subject uh, of this uh, panel, uh, we were. Um, I was. I was going to speak about the civil society in Russia and uh, and uh, what is really measurable in in the civil society of today in Russia. How can we appreciate and um, evaluate the scale um, of uh, uh, of uh, the movements, um, the movements in in the Russian society, and indeed, both in um, um, we have heard uh, the words of um, of Madame La Lumière and of Lena Nemirovskaya about uh, the necessity uh, to stand guard of our values. Now. Um, I think that uh, this is only possible to do if we can quantify some of the things that we have to measure. So what is the um, uh, potential for the collective action? What is the potential for the uh, civil uh, development? And if we remember um, uh, the book of Christopher Patton, um, uh, and I, I read uh, his book in, in, in the Russian edition by the Moscow School, um, I think that we can speak about, uh, uh, about some measurable um, outcomes of uh, social research. So um, if we uh, go to a different level where we speak about uh, help for others uh, or uh, the willingness uh, to help others, uh, materially speaking, uh, uh, then, of course, there are less people uh, who are mm, interested in uh, direct help uh, by sacrificing something. But uh, when we speak about almsgiving, when we sacrifice something, then uh, it is often not about uh, some long-term uh, programs or relations, but uh, rather uh, uh, some uh, um, single... Uh, single actions. Uh, so it is uh, often difficult to evaluate uh, how many people in Russia would be willing to participate in civic initiatives on a long-term basis. Uh, and probably the most sophisticated level, finally, is when we talk about protection of rights uh, uh, or uh, indeed civic engagement. There, uh, I could say, uh, we have uh, about probably 10% uh, of the entire population who are in any way um, involved uh, in the um, civic uh, activities. So, uh, when we uh, deliberate about such long-term uh, civic projects, uh, then of course these are uh, by far not numerous, um, to say the least. Uh, when we Uh, speak about protection or breach of rights, uh, then most people uh, start thinking about social and economic rights, and the political rights come in the last uh, place, uh, such as the inertia of, uh, of uh, um, political thinking, as we sometimes uh, say to ourselves. But it's not so... Um, it's not so 
straightforward because uh, when a question is asked in a poll, um, uh, do you feel yourself vulnerable, then about 80% of those sampled uh, respond that uh, they do feel vulnerable uh, and uh, they do feel challenged by the government, uh, although they may not be willing to express it uh, in the human rights uh, terminology. So. Uh, uh, it is often a question of language and, uh, and a question of how a particular question in the social survey is uh, formulated. Uh, mm, because uh, when uh, you have a focus group uh, and you ask, uh, do you have rights, uh, people respond, yes, we have constitutional rights. Uh, they're on a piece of paper, but we don't seem to have them in real life. So it, it seems to be quite difficult to measure some things and and uh, and try and understand what is happening in in reality <coughs> so when we speak about social involvement uh, civic involvement i think that as the time passes and we're measuring it um for we've been measuring it for about 10 years we can see that uh, we can we can rather speak about qualitative uh, changes because in quantitative terms uh, we don't see uh, so um, so much change but at the same time we should not disparage uh, of the qualitative changes because uh, after all um, unification of resources uh, um, even in qualitative terms may eventually uh, lead to quantitative change. So, uh, there is uh, certainly less uh, social apathy um, uh, in the Russian society today compared to even several years ago. I remember uh, we had uh, a talk on Radio Liberty uh, with um, We had a talk with the uh, head of the of the committee of uh, soldiers' mothers, uh, 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 and uh, this uh, this was a talk on the Radio Liberty, and and we were say we were speaking that how how bad it all is. But then when I asked her, uh, is it is it as, as bad as say fifteen years ago? And she said, no, not it's much better than fifteen years ago. So it really is a vantage point. It is a point. A ref where where you start uh, uh, looking at things, but um, it's probably not about citizen, not only about citizen, not only about uh, socially active persons. There's there's also another perspective that we can assume, say a populist uh, pers pers perspective, and and because uh, citizens uh, are um, are the people in the streets, uh, and. Um, in this sense, I think that the social landscape in Russia is changing even, uh, even more uh, pronounced in a in a, in a in a more pronounced way. And generally, the attitude uh, of uh, of the bureaucrats uh, uh, towards. Uh, uh, the people's concern in uh, uh, Russia and in the Soviet Union has uh, always been uh, um, uh, at a very low level. Uh, but uh, it appears that today uh, there is a more uh, social um, uh, uh, social movement uh, um, uh, in Russia over the past uh, eight years because, uh, say, starting from 2012, uh, the outcome of the elections uh, started to be of keen interest uh, to the people in Russia. Uh, so this um, growing uh, uh, conscience that elections may change, some, change something, even if they do not change something at the moment, is a sign of growing uh, social um, uh, 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 conscience uh, in uh, in the Russian society. <coughs> it appears that we have uh, now come back to the situation of 2010. 
and 2011, because in 2014 we had this uh, after effects uh, of the Crimean uh, euphoria when uh, there seemed to be uh, no um, no difference in the pro-governmental and the overall uh, Russian society. So, uh, and today I think that we are uh, seeing that this uh, Crimean euphoria has subsided and we went back to the situation of 2011, 2012 because um, uh, at that time uh, over, over these five years, or four years after 2014, no social ills in Russia have been treated. And after this wave uh, of, uh, of uh, mm, the Crimean sentiment uh, has gone down, uh, people uh, are again facing the same concerns which were of such importance to them five years ago. But uh, although they have been obscured or overshadowed uh, by this uh, patriotic zeal. There is less money in the society and uh, there is more uh, objection um, against the government. Uh, 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 and I think that we are uh, arriving uh, at a more uh, uh, at a more um, difficult, uh, at, at a more um, seething uh, situation, situation of greater uh, social uh, activity or even uh, unrest. Uh, and uh, there has been some experience accumulated in terms of social networks um, in urban communities. Uh, there have been some uh, uh, horizontal uh, ties uh, which seem to have been developing over the past uh, uh, years. Uh, and uh, at the time when uh, uh, this experience uh, of uh, social interaction is being uh, accumulated, we can see how uh, how this uh, social involvement has a potential uh, to grow. We saw it in 2015 after protests. We looked at it and realized that I had the internet has brought this about. Television also has undergone some change. The important thing that a crisis in some things that happen, they reveal some changes that have taken place. What is to be done about this? Well, we recently discussed it at uh, the memorial in Moscow. Different opinions were voiced. What I want to say that I was saying at that time what seemed important to me, and I referred to today's event. I think what matters today is to care about one another because this means a lot of tension when you think about what is going on when you try to oppose it you, you to things that are, and people break down and their health fails. And I think it's so important to take care of your near and dear, to value, treasure, and develop these joint, so to say, communities, events, where we can uh, exchange opinions, and not only experience, but also give emotional support. I think this is important too, and one needn't forget about this. What would happen next is to look for allies beyond the country, not necessarily within the country, and in some way look for a common language. Because as we see, sometimes it doesn't necessarily always work when we seem to be speaking about one and the same thing. We hear each other and we understand one another, not necessarily we do that. Although we seem to be working for the common cause and for the cause that is actually needed by many more people, although uh, some people may understand it in a different, from a different perspective. I suppose this has to be done too, not only go beyond, but also with, with from within. This is a work that needs to be performed. Thank you. Um, from here, it's perfect to move on to uh, Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> Denise already mentioned that in 2014, 
uh, power and society became one, and now, now we are <coughs> splitting again. Mm. Many of us followed the whole night the events on the uh, Azov Sea, and and these are often explained by uh, insufficient ratings of of actually two presidents, Poroshenko as as well as as Putin. So, give us a view from Ukraine, not necessarily about the Azov Sea, because that is. Um, a foggy matter that maybe we, we don't fully understand, but if you want to go into that, you're welcome to as well. Спасибо, Кадри. Я хотел бы сейчас сказать об изменении. To speak about the changes, about the quality of public policy in the region, in eastern part of the European continent. And based upon this context, I'd like to say what has been going on in Ukraine. This eastern part is used to be a post-communist and post-Soviet Europe, but now we must speak about a region uh, from Milano and Vienna to Ankara and Moscow. <laughs> this is the region, this part of the east and the central Europe that is going through one and the same common tragedy. This tragedy of illiberalism or a liberal turn, turn for illiberalism. Illiberalism is a negative definition. What is spreading, what brings together this part of Europe? There is national conservative sovereignty aspiration that seems to be spreading in countries and political cultures and political systems of this new region. We are speaking about sovereignism as a way to deny universal liberal values, as a way to reject and deny universal rights, human rights, and trying to bring to the fore particular national rights, trying to bring them to the fore, collective rights, and the rule of these collective interests. I would put it this way. National conservative means that the ruling groups in the systems coin imagine, come, come up with these majority systems that seem to be uh, speaking on behalf of this collective majority, on whose behalf they are suppressing individual rights and they reject universal values. In this national conservative liberalism, there are four types of systems. The most illiberal, the most unfree, they are the ones that are seen in the Eastern Oriental built from repressive illiberal authoritarianism of Turkey ending in Moscow, Minsk and Baku. Next year, in several months, we would celebrate 25 years of dictatorship in Belarus. That was the first post-Soviet, post-communist dictatorship, At that thought it was thought to be the last dictatorship in Europe, but as it turned out, Belarus is the driving engine of history that is at the forefront of a liberal turn. The second tip, illiberal democracies from Riga to Sofia via, via Prague, via Bratislava. The leaders in this illiberal Europe are, of course, Poland and Hungary with their irrational majority policy, with violations of rights, where they undermine the constitutional system that defends the balance of power and they spread national conservative ideologies. There is a unique country that doesn't fit into either group. This is Estonia. That seems to be Kadri. Here are my compliments for your country. That is the only country that is showing liberal growth against the background of others, but this is a unique case because top three countries are the countries where belong those who are known, where there's still controversy about what to call them, either defective democracy or defective authoritarianism in Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. Three countries, three societies that try to build democracy, but their attempts are undermined by clans, by informal groups that at all times 
are finding loopholes and get the power back and uh, suppress yet another liberal aspiration. And type four of political systems, they are so-called systems, in English they're known as world orderism. Uh, they are unrecognized states that evolve like a radical periphery that live under sanctions, the most isolated states that also are growing and developing. Back in 1994, there were only four of them, and in these unrecognized states, they were inhabited by millions of Europeans. Now there are six countries like this, de facto, yes, of which are in fact states, and they are inhabited by over four million Europeans. The growth, in both in terms of quality and quantity, is there. And this type of highly unfree regimes, highly unliberal, illiberal economies, but they've shown their viability, and they seem to be spreading across the rest of Europe, the negative types of waste policy of secessionism. And in this context, Ukraine is one of the last countries that has been trying to oppose this general entropy in political cultures. And in 13 and 14, was trying to get itself back, and maybe the whole region, on the path of liberal democracy, Euromaidan, where I'm very happy to show you this book. There's years, uh, there's on the breaking point of the liberal revolution. It's still hot from the press. Uh, Yegor Chizhov present here is one of co-authors on this book. And somebody who made it possible and published is Polina Lavrova. Yes, and she wrote a foreword. This is a very interesting book, very honest, which is very difficult to write because Ukraine, after attempts to introduce liberal democracy, has followed its path. Five years, well, Euromaidan started exactly five years ago in Kiev. And this European liberal universalist program that was the, the program of those who went out in the streets of Maidan and Kiev and other cities and towns, as, as I speak, in Ukraine, under the influence of the war, annexation of Crimea and loss of territory in Donbass has been going through dire straits. If we look under the influence of war, Ukraine now develops as a clash between two political programs. One is pro-European, Euro pro-integration idea, liberal idea, and the other is program of the war that seeks to disciplining, discipline society that is con fully controlled by the ruling groups. And this conflict is producing its own effect. The war gives rise to lack of freedom, lack of liberty. The war stops short all discussions. And the book that just been published in Ukraine, because it just reminds of what was going on there. It is a neutral. I'm amazed by Yegor and his colleagues and four authors who succeeded in staying neutral in their language. The self-discipline in describing what was going on in Maidan in the next two years, the beginning of the war and how the Ukrainian society has been changing and the spirit of civics in Ukraine. It's a difficult book. As you read it now, you willingly start to compare with what they wanted and what they ended in now. This is a difficult time for the country that again is getting immersed into a conflict under the influence of the tension in the Azov Sea. Again, explosions, again, the shootings, shellings, which says that the position between these two programs, a standoff, is going on, and Ukraine's yet another chance to aspire for liberal democracy has been lost. I'd like to go back to regional context. Thomas just mentioned 
the European liberals never paying any attention to how the societies responded to a joint breakthrough in public policy where the European Union is becoming even stronger, a publicly legal organism. And this is where we see a standoff that has been changing Europe and that under whose influence we see these uprisings in the spirit of sovereignty. This is this gap, this chasm, between public policy and social movements. Social movements start to undermine the public. When there is a, a union between the public, that is freedom, liberty, uh, equality and rights, and social, this is inequality, hierarchy, ethnic, confessional, cultural, and other inequality and diversity. When they start to oppose one another, you get the effect of liberally defective democracies that we see in Central and Southern Europe. Today's Italy, or today's Austria, or what literally yesterday took place in Switzerland, show that even old democracies are not immune from the disease of the war between the social and the public uh, that is taking place in Eastern Europe. And I agree with Thomas as he says that we should in somehow positive way trying to find f for opportunities. I suppose they are there. There's standoff, opposition between the social and the public may make both Europeans in the west of the continent and in the east of the continent seek for new ways to attain balance between the social and the public. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Thank you very much for good words for Estonia. To be honest, I sometimes also feel that in Estonia, we've got something special. For example, me, many people say about the tension between local and cosmopolitan. As I look upon myself, I never experience it. Quite the opposite. For me, I have very local. I've got a small village, a hooter, a small outpost for 300 years owned by my family. And indeed, very, very local person in this sense. It's, but I'm also cosmopolitan. I feel that these local roots make me quite cosmopolitan, whereas my cosmopolitan nature helps me see the value and treasure the roots. I often think if there is some kind of general universal lesson, because we can attain harmony between the people, and maybe this harmony indeed is in, for example, Estonia, this cosmopolitan nature, cosmopolitanism, helped these local values evolve like, get stronger. The local identity is safer. Uh, Karl Birt put it in his, uh, was saying, go out. Uh, and that might be one one of the lessons. I'm trying to figure out whether there are more. If I, if I find a few more, then I will write about it. But now we're to Frederick. Thank you. Um, and uh, returning to the headline of this panel, politics and civics, um, uh, I will approach this topic from the lens and perspective of norms and normative order. Uh, and I will also come back to what Kadri brought up initially uh, uh, when, when external and internal politics meets, when domestic and foreign policy uh, meets. Um, and I would uh, also um, like to go back not to 1979, but to 1975, um, uh, uh, which is the start of the then CSE, which then turned into the OSCE. Um, and the Helsinki Final Act of uh, 1975, and, and, and which was then followed up by the Paris Charter in 1990. But I think these were truly revolutionary documents um, in the European uh, history and, and in the history of international relations. Because uh, here are the roots of this idea that there is a direct link between security between states, on the one hand, and 
what is going on inside these states on the other hand. That is respect for democracy, for human rights and the principles of rule of law. Uh, this idea was introduced in, 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 in Helsinki Final Act and it was then uh, more clearly spelled out in the Paris Charter of, of 1990. We speak a lot about these uh, days about uh, uh, um, uh, global uh, liberal order, but also European security order. And, and uh, when we try to define or find what, what is this European security order, where, where do we find it? I think the Helsinki Final Act and the Paris Charter is a very good uh, starting place to, to, um, uh, 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 to try to define this European security order. And I would like to call this the, the Old and New Testament of the European Security Order. Um, uh, and there's also, uh, 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 and if you spell this out, um, uh, the, the, the link, if, if you turn it to the more extreme, uh, which has materialized today, which we see in Europe today, you see that the, the, there is a direct correlation between internal repression and external aggression. And these are sort of mutually uh, reinforcing each other. States that have enjoy uh, 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 free media, uh, pluralistic and free uh, uh, democratic elections and party system, opposition and so forth, uh, will have much bigger problems uh, uh, going into external uh, adventures, uh, uh, aggressions against other countries. And once you have engaged in an aggression against another country, you will need to tighten the screws for free media, for opposition, uh, and the freedom of expression, and the freedom of, of assembly, and so forth. This is exactly what we have seen uh, uh, when it comes uh, to the Russian-Ukrainian aggression uh, since 2014. Uh, so, the basic idea, I mean, these things are important in themselves, democracy, rule of law, and human rights, for self-evident and obvious reasons. Sometimes we forget this, and I think we need to remind ourselves all the time about this. And I also, uh, I'm a little bit saddened that we are definitely living in, in times of, of, of crisis, in times of flux, of times of, of challenges. And I think one European institution that is uh, um, too little talked about and too little mentioned and too little remembered is definitely the Council of Europe. I mean, this is the basis of, of, of this uh, uh, exactly of these principles and which are now challenged both internally and externally uh, and I think uh, we would do much better actually returning to the roots uh, uh, um, on, on which the Council of Europe is, is based. One important concept uh, 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 that belongs to this is the concept of accountability. What is laid down in, 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 in documents like the Helsinki Final Act and the Paris uh, Charter, uh, these are principles, these are political commitments that these, uh, all our governments have signed up to. Uh, these are not uh, sort of, uh, you know, anyone's ideas or Western ideas or any particular principles that someone is trying to enforce on someone else. We have all signed up on them and they are, uh, at the end of the day, they are universal and they're also based uh, on the principles of, of the UN Charter. Uh, but these are political commitments, and how can we uphold them? Well, we need to uphold them by holding uh, 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 each other uh, accountable. Uh, and uh, th these tools, and, and not least the Council of Europe, gives us tools of holding each other accountable. Uh, states uh, not only have uh, 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 the right, but also the, actually the obligation to hold each other accountable. This is something that it's spelled out in a little known uh, uh, document of the OSC called actually the Moscow Declaration, I think it's from 92 or 93, uh, uh, where we're actually obliged to uh, hold each other accountable, uh, not least because of the reasons of security. Because if things start to go wrong in one country with democracy, with rule of law and, and human rights, uh, sooner or later, uh, you will uh, uh, encounter the risk of actually this also being a security problem between the states, as we have uh, uh, also seen uh, 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 over the last decade. Um, sometimes you hear the reference that, uh, well, this is a, a legitimate uh, interference in internal affairs. 
Uh, well, it's not, be exactly because we have all our governments signed up to these principles and also the principles to each other, to hold each other uh, accountable of this. Um, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons, uh, uh, and historians will keep on arguing about this, as to why um, the Soviet Union and Communist and Eastern Bloc fell. But I think exactly this idea that there are some common norms and standards and principles that I, as also a citizen in a country, can refer to. These are sort of criteria, uh, um, uh, uh, and the fact that the, pa the Helsinki Final Act was actually published uh, uh, publicly in all, all the signatory states, including, I can't remember if it was the Izvestia and Pravda in 1970, but it was one of them. Um, and this was an enormous boost for the dissidents. This was the, the, the gave the birth to Charter 77 and Helsinki committees and commissions uh, 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 all over Europe. Um, and the, the, the idea that empowered the citizens, the in individuals, that actually uh, uh, um, I might not have the might on my side, but I have the right on my side, and I can actually, there are principles I can refer to and actually my government had actually signed up to these principles. Uh, this is not some, some, some uh, cultural imperialism from, uh, from abroad or, or anything like that. Um, and I think the idea is that we, the, 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 the governments, holding governments accountable is important, but the most important thing is that we can have individuals and civil society holding also governments, our own governments, in the first hand, but also other governments accountable. So the principle, I would put the principle, uh, bring back the principle of accountability in, 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 in the discussion. And accountable to what? Well, exactly to those principles and norms that do exist. They are violated, they are questioned, no doubt about that. But I think we have to stick to them uh, just because someone is, 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 is breaking the law doesn't make the law uh, uh, irrelevant or, or inadequate. Uh, uh, but we need to, to find ways to, to, to enforce the law uh, and, and, and this. Uh, so I think uh, the role of uh, free media, of civil society, uh, is more important than ever. Um, and I think we should, instead of trying to discuss and design new security orders or trying to arrange ourselves or adapt ourselves to those who want to have alternative orders, I think we should stick exactly to the order and principles we have. Um, let's think a little bit, what, what would the alternatives be? Um, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, this, and I also wanted to provoke a, a discussion and, and counter arguments here. Um, Russia has been in clear, and or are in, uh, Kremlin is in clear violation of these principles and these orders. Uh, 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 there was a war against Georgia in 2008, and there's an ongoing military aggression in, since 2014. Uh, and as, 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 as Kadri mentioned, uh, uh, we all watch TV and, 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 and follow social media, what's going on the, on the catch. As obviously, I think uh, this, in, in a normal world, this would be considered to be an extremely serious uh, situation in, in, in Europe. Uh, Russia, uh, Kremlin changed, uh, first of all, introduced that military violence is, is uh, they tried to make military violence a legitimate political uh, means in 21st century Europe. Um, the uh, uh, attempt to illegally annex Crimea is the first uh, attempt to change borders through military uh, force in Europe since 1945. Um, um, but it's not only, uh, 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 and it's doing this to Ukraine, and we can all have different theories on why, as to what are the motives to this, and I think I can see at least three motives. One of them is, is domestic regime survival, um, exactly for the reasons uh, uh, um, uh, that uh, Mikhail was pointing out uh, of Euromaidan and, and the goals of Euromaidan. Uh, the, the Kremlin could not allow Euromaidan to be, to be successful because if it could happen in a post-Soviet, Eastern Slavonic-speaking, Orthodox country, 
uh, uh, like Ukraine, it could happen in a post-Soviet uh, Orthodox Eastern Slavonic-speaking country like Russia. So the one, the one is, is domestic politics and regime survival. I think the other is, is to establish this idea of, of power politics, balance of power, ultimately based on military power and, and the willingness to use military power. Um, uh, as a, a legitimate principle in European politics, and there also this idea of spheres of influence and unequal sovereignty. Spheres of influence means is that some countries decide the fate of other countries. Uh, weaker countries, smaller countries, countries that are considered to be in between or something like that. I come from a smaller country that sometimes is considered to be a country in between, so I'm seriously worried about if we have a sort of growing creeping acceptance of these ideas. Because if it can happen to Ukraine, it can happen to countries uh, uh, like mine or Qadris or, 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 or other countries. Uh, but I think there's a third, uh, uh, it's not only that, that the Kremlin violates these principles in order, but it also questions it. It wants to change it. And this idea comes back. This is not hidden. Uh, Kremlin and Kremlin representatives speaks openly about this. And I think one of the most interesting speeches was made uh, uh, by Putin, the so-called Valdai speech in, in um, uh, 2014, it must be, which says that new uh, rules or no rules. That was, I mean, you were even probably, probably there, Kadri, but I think the idea was either you adapt to the rules to our interest, or we have no rules, that is anarchy, and this is exactly what we are showing you in, in Ukraine now. The option actually to sit, stick to the existing set of rules, to the Helsinki and Paris principles, was not obviously an option for the Kremlin there. And I think this is something we should be uh, uh, very worried about. Uh, and, and again, uh, I'm not naive. Uh, um, uh, I see what's going on and I see the challenges and perhaps one of the challenges that makes me most worried is, um, is the internal um, turmoil and challenges of, 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 of the Western world as, as, a, as a whole, but also in, within the EU and, and Europe. And the question is whether we still adhere and believe in our own values, so to say. Uh, but still, uh, I think we need, uh, we have a system, we have norms. Uh, let's stick to them, let's defend them. Uh, uh, each and one of us as individuals, as citizens, have a responsibility. Civil society has a responsibility. Journalism uh, uh, organizations have a responsibility. Uh, so let's stick to the norms we have. It will be a, a rough ride. It will be difficult. Uh, but let's stick to this as a regulative ideal. Because what is the alternative? Uh, and the alternative is that we accept uh, military violence as, as a legitimate uh, political means. It, it means that uh, uh, some states are more sovereign than others, uh, that uh, uh, principles of human rights, democracy, and, and, and rule of law uh, are, are to be, uh, they are negotiable, or they are, you know, they are not important. Uh, and I think this applies for all our societies. We have difficult discussions today whether uh, the problem is often portrayed as a trade-off, as a balance between freedom on the one hand and security on the other hand. Uh, it comes when we discuss terrorism, it comes when we discuss uh, um, hybrid warfare or, or, or the role of, of social media and internet so forth. I think that way of formulating the problem of the question uh, forgets the whole idea why, why we have freedom there in the first case and what we are protecting ourselves against. But let's stick to the existing uh, normative order uh, as a regulative ideal and I think uh, the, the, the concept of regulati uh, regulative ideal goes back to Kant, and uh, we are back to Sapere Ode and, and the Enlightenment. So I, I finish off there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frederick, and all panelists. Do you have any comment on, on, on each other's uh, statements, or shall we go straight to audience for, for questions? We have. We have 30 minutes for uh, questions and answers. So, yeah, I see uh, lots of hands. Let's, let's start from this corner behind my back. Uh, thank you. Good morning and thank you for your uh, very interesting thoughts. I would pick up to the last one 
that we should. Ah, I'm sorry, Ivan Adragicevic Croatian School. Hi, sorry. Uh, norms, we should stick to the norms that we have. I must disagree with that, not in terms of catastrophe that's being posed by whatever you want to call it, you know, sovereignist or populist or reverse uh, trends that we have in our Western democracies or things that's been going on with Putin's Russia or whatever you want to call it, China or friends uh, or club of authoritarian bodies that we are witnessing in today's world. But I think that the challenges as a humanity that we are facing today uh, call for new norms and new regulations. We have post-Second World War order with this functional UN as a main, I think, guarantee of this peace that we all wanted after these two great catastrophes on our soils in 20th century. And what Lena mentioned with AI, with robots, with complete undermining of facts, which was mentioned by Tomai at the beginning. I think that we all as thinking people from that positive side of the history, let's call it that way, need to rethink these new norms. Of course, try to advocate always on the situaionite or whatever you want to call it, you know, this basic principle of protecting human rights. But I, I really do firmly believe that we need new norms because all these people uh, appeared in our world because I think these old norms don't function anymore. That's only my opi opinion. You can challenge that after. Thank you. Thank you. I think we will collect a few questions and then back to panel. But we'll, uh, uh, next, yeah, please. It's not seem to be a very clear-cut definition. So when we speak about, about the lost universalism, are we the universalists? Because Europe is probably not very um, uh, homogeneous in this sense. Because, And I think that this is a very important question, because when we speak about solidarity and trust, uh, mm, then it is the question about us, uh, us in this hall, us in this audience. And I think that this is... Um, not an abstract question. When you say that it is important to um, uh, promote political dialogue uh, um, between different centers, uh, uh, but we know that, that very different centers um, profess different views. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting uh, questions. Uh, yes, more. Yes, please. Pavel Botnyansky from Kiev, uh, the Ukraine. Um, I had uh, Student Republic NGO. My question is to all panelists. Uh, when um, we observe militarization in this world today and, uh, and uh, the uh, undermining uh, of uh, the foundations of the post-war order, uh, um, I think that uh, um, alarmist tendencies are quite natural and we can see how things are uh, how things are um, uh, getting worse. Uh, let's just reflect on on uh, Brazil's elections and an outright populist coming, uh, an ultra right populist coming uh, to to the to the helm of the government. Uh, and there are there are very many um, uh, cases uh, which cause uh, alarm. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, for the first uh, time, um, uh, the Russian and the Ukrainian. Uh, uh, military um, forces uh, have had uh, an outright uh, conflict uh, in uh, the Strait of Kerch um, as of uh, these uh, days. And so the question that I'm asking myself and all panelists, uh, where is uh, uh, the deliberation on peace? Uh, where are the calls uh, to peace? Um, both in uh, Russia and in the Ukraine, that we have to stand back and indeed reserve ourselves and indeed not allow uh, a full-scale war to rage in Europe or elsewhere. Where are the covenants uh, of peace? Uh, where is uh, uh, an attempt to, to establish uh, uh, civic uh, uh, peace? And uh, while my questions may be uh, rhetorical, uh, what can we as free citizens do? Uh, 
uh, to contain the threat uh, of uh, war, to contain the threat of obscurantism, which uh, seems to be more and more uh, common. I think that, uh, like uh, uh, Steve uh, Bannon was uh, trying to talk about an ultra right uh, international, I think that uh, there has to be uh, an, uh, um, uh, uh, an indeed a rallying uh, of, uh, of the people of goodwill in uh, different uh, nations, different countries, in many cases contrary to the wills of uh, the populist governments. Thank you. Yes, please. Varujan Harutunyan from uh, the Yerevan School of Political Studies. It seems to be that the questions of uh, democratization and consolidation uh, must be viewed through the prism of a primordial society whereby social mobilization and the development of the civil society mm, uh, uh, clash with the institutional uh, system. Alexander Dobrovolsky, head of the Belarusian School of Political Studies. I, I, I'm very impressed uh, uh, by this discussion, and, and I'm very much interested by, by the contribution of Mr. Minakov. Uh, um, uh, do you not uh, feel that the uh, Ottoman repercussions that you have mentioned is not efficient. The regimes that you have mentioned are the um, uh, fragments of, uh, of the uh, empires of old, and uh, such uh, fragments uh, of empires or figments of empire are governed uh, from the metropolitan uh, capitals. Uh, um, thank you very much. Uh, all right. A few questions, and then we can do another round or two. Uh, Frederick, maybe we'll start with you. A few questions. Please. Well, uh, I understood two questions that were directly addressed to me. Um, uh, the one is that the challenges to humanity calls for 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 new norms. Um, uh, um, I don't think necessarily we disagree. I think what you are looking for are new institutions, not necessarily new norms. Um, the, I mean, the UN system. Um, uh, the UN system is 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 uh, it's a fab manifold fabric consisting of norms and of institutions. And I think uh, when you when you when you talk, and this is a, some I think an interesting observation is that when Western, uh, um, when we speak about the international global rules based order based on the UN system. Um, uh, the Kremlin representative said that we are also defending the rules-based UN order. And we do it from two totally different understandings of this order. Uh, because the, I think the Kremlin perspective is that the, 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 U, the UN order is a continuation and a legitimization of the Yalta-Potsdam uh, order. Which means that Russia has a veto in, in the Security Council and, 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 and it can use the veto, uh, yes. But the, I don't think, uh, and, and uh, when, when Western leaders speak about the UN-based, you know, global order, they speak about, you know, the UN Charter and so forth. So that's why I think we, we sometimes misunderstand. Uh, there is a deeper. Uh, uh, so I don't think necessarily, you know, if you ask yourselves, we need new norms and we need to readjust the norms or adjust the norms and balance. I think the counter question is always, how and what is it that you're willing to give up. Um, um, on, on, on Kosovo, uh, I think this is, of course, an argument that is often very, uh, heard, very often heard and very often brought up. I have some intellectual difficulties to see uh, the full parallels of Kosovo and Crimea, because no one has annexed, illegally annexed uh, Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo is not part of, no, no foreign country has moved the military into Kosovo and taken it over and uh, annexed it. I think if there's an historical parallel, it's probably more likely Chechnya and the whole idea of, of, of uh, um, uh, bringing constitutional order back. The Kosovo was also, uh, uh, yes, borders was changed, um, uh, but it was not an uh, annexation. Um, uh, but that process was also uh, uh, through the background of, of serious human rights violations and even genocide in, in former Yugoslavia. 
And there was a very long discussion in, in the UN and the UN Security Council preceding that. So I think the Kosovo is not necessarily, uh, 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 for the obvious reasons that it was not annexed by an, anyone else and, and military force was not used for foreign annexation. So I think it's a, a, it's a parallel that doesn't really fully work, so to say. First of all, thank you very much for all these uh, in fact, very difficult questions. <laughs> so I will try to go for the first one about the, to rethink about new norms and so on. Well, first of all, I, I, I think it's much more easy to deconstruct than to construct. Uh, that's simplistic uh, put in this way, but uh, I think we should all reread, you know, the Declaration of uh, Human Rights 1948. And uh, this text seems to me highly uh, valid, and I don't think it's something, you know, coming from a sort of uh, pro-Western approach or something like that. I mean, it was signed at that time. So we should also respect uh, all signatures and especially for things coming from um, from the from the past so it would be my, my first answer uh, i see you know all these debates about for instance the uh, com the composition of the uh, united nations security council which is not reflecting the, the new of the force that's absolutely true um, but as soon as you 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 think about you know for instance to allege it to india you are raised not from the, the Westerners, but from China. If you mention, you know, Japan, that would be the same. If you speak about, you know, an African country to come, which one to be picked up? And at the same time, you know, I think that international security, it's all the time a sort of very uh, subtle mix between balance of power. We should not avoid that. And let, let me continue. And collective security. So my, my very first point is uh, we should build up on what is uh, on what it does exist. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I have no no personal perception on that. Second, to go in your direction, there are new uh, phenomena. For instance, cyber. For instance, you know, bioethics. All these very uh, fundamental issues. Is the system uh, adjust to that? Uh, certainly not, because it can be dealt in a few interstate, interstate ways, even if some country like Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Sudan, would like, for instance, to uh, uh, have a, a cyber governance through an internet st interstate sorry, uh, systems. So I think that what should be innovated, it's to find new ways for multi-stakes orders, you know. The ability, and it was, for instance, the method used for the COP21, ability to address with civilian societies, with economic actors and so on. But it needs a lot of time, a lot of resources, but I do believe that for public goods, that's the only way. So, uh, my answer would be it's much more question of process than, you know, a sort of uh, question of a new grand soir, as we said, you know, in politics, grand soir, everything will be changed and everything will be better the day after. No, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. So let's be more incremental and le let's be more, try to have, a, I would say, a multi-stakeholder approach on different uh, areas. Kosovo, I fully align with Ambassador. I think that this parallel is, uh, it doesn't work at all, you know. It was a reaction of the uh, international community after so many killed people. And uh, as you said, you know, I don't, I, I, uh, in, in my knowledge, you know, Kosovo is not annexed by a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, the question on militarization and in fact ought to avoid this militarization. Uh, there is a paradox on that. First, I refer to an initiative taken by uh, President Macron, Paris Peace Forum, which was precisely uh, a, an initiative to try to get some 
ideas from the civilian societies. What what was we were involved, you know, with my institute. What was striking during this initiative? It is a celebration for the end of the First World War, the morning at Arc de Triomphe. By the way, that's not the end of the First World War for everyone. For instance, if you discuss with the Turks, if you discuss with the people from Hungary and others, that's uh, the, uh, November uh, 1918 is not the end of the First World War, which is also interesting. So you had all the head of states, and the afternoon you, you had the opening of this uh, Paris Peace Forum with that, with that one head of state, which was President Trump. And that's very telling, I think. Uh, the fact that the, the, the president of the main power which created its uh, international liberal order does not defend it is, from my point of view, you know, the, the, the main evolution in terms of international politics. And it creates much more um, uh, turbulences than stability, uh, obviously. Um, <coughs> Now, how to con con uh, con uh, contain the threat of war? And that's a paradox, sorry to, to stop with that, but uh, I think that Europeans, especially Western Europeans, but also uh, countries from uh, Central Europe, um, in fact, depends uh, dividends of peace since two decades. Let me explain. As soon as you uh, refuse to spend for your own security, and it was the choice made by many European countries. Um, don't be surprised, you know, if your security is uh, an object for others, especially for the US and for Russia. So I think that the Europeans' uh, the main problem is certainly to have uh, the famous historical lesson, civis passem parabellum. If you want peace, prepare war. So we should, in fact, reject war by preparing ourselves and do consider that the rights, the law, are not sufficient if they are not, you know, uh, put with also the ability to enforce them. На вопрос скорее про кто мы, я имел в виду, что, наверное, who are us, uh, to revert to the question of Elmira from, from Kyrgyzstan. Um, if uh, we assume that, uh, uh, that um, we, uh, the we, are confined to those uh, convened in this room, then it is certainly not sufficient. But when we talk about the lines according to which we can, um, we can agree, uh, then it is um, a very interesting question. I remember talking uh, to Mr. Shainis uh, years ago in Russia, and I said, why is it that the Democrats, the Democrats failed? Uh, Mr. Shainis told me, actually, it was not uh, the Democrats uh, per se who prevailed in Russia in 1991. It was a very wide um, a group of uh, of people, uh, uh, only a, a part, uh, an insignificant part of, of whom were Democrats uh, in the true sense of the word. So it is really understanding what is the principle which could be unifying to a maximally large uh, number of people. So we have to sit uh, together and indeed think what are the lines, what are the common grounds, what are the principles that can come uh, together and, and, and bring people together. Uh, I will try to comment on several um, questions. Um, and comments made from from the from the audience. I do not think that the norms of the international law should be reviewed. Uh, what I would like to think to consider is that these norms um, and the mechanisms uh, of uh, of of these implementation must be reviewed. It is clear to me that uh, both the United Nations and the Council of Europe are in crisis. Um, both organizations uh, have failed uh, in uh, uh, some ways. Does it uh, cause a reform? Certainly. Do we have to enlarge a number of countries with the veto right? Uh, 
I, I, I don't think so. What I do think is that the right of veto should be given up mm, as a concept. Now, this is a much more challenging task. Uh, we have uh, uh, the example of uh, General Secretary Annan, uh, who tried uh, uh, the reform, and the United States certainly did not show them from the best uh, um, uh, side. So, but what does it mean? It means that the UN needs a reform, but it doesn't need to be disbanded. Now, the Council of Europe, this school is a part of this Council of Europe. To us, Council of Europe is home. Um, where Council of Europe cannot act in itself, uh, then it works through the schools, like, like this one. So these schools are agents of change. They are agents of a civilizational choice. And uh, I think that this is very well understood by the authoritarian governments of today. So um, the Council of Europe, uh, which... Uh, uh, um, uh, must uh, uh, start with the new projects and uh, every day must be a new beginning uh, so we should never um, lower our um, hands uh, uh, in uh, passivity uh, uh, with respect to the question about uh, uh, Kosovo um, there's a big question uh, if uh, uh, the uh, Kosovo case uh, was legitimate, but certainly this was not a case of annexation. Uh, as uh, to uh, the de facto states, uh, indeed, um, uh, uh, the warlordism is just a description of uh, of the of the regime. But what happens uh, in these de facto states, there is a whole shadow economy behind them. There, there are three forms of these de facto states. Uh, this, uh, the de facto states, the sponsor states, and the mother or oh, um, parental states. Uh, Nagorno karabakh um, uh, South Ossetia, uh, Abkhazia, uh, two republics in Donetsk, and the Transnistria. These are the de facto states of Europe. If we look uh, with, at the sponsor states, these are Armenia and Russia. If we look at the parental states, it's the Azerbaijan, the Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova. If we look at uh, how secession affects um, uh, the international um, standing, uh, we can see certainly anti-liberal and anti-democratic uh, forces, because in the so-called parental states, uh, the conservatives uh, are saying that these are, uh, uh, you could never trust these secessionists. We have to control the minorities. And this institutional gap, which immediately uh, comes up, uh, is the negative effect, which is uh, redoubled every time uh, secession um, deepens. Uh, the ultra, the, the conservatives in the so-called parental states start saying that the secessionists uh, were always uh, suspicious. Uh, and in the sponsor states, uh, um, uh, there is the entrenchment uh, of, the, of the conservatives uh, mm, which seek uh, to uh, protect uh, uh, these uh, de facto states. If we look at the so-called Eastern Partnership, uh, uh, region. And then five of these countries uh, have uh, territorial problems, uh, unsettled territorial disputes, and only one country, uh, Belarus, uh, uh, which is uh, an interesting case uh, of authoritarian stability for the moment. So, um, it seems uh, to me that what Pavel has uh, said, we can see um, a, a very, very dangerous situation in the Eastern Europe. It's not an, an alarmism on my part. Um, I'm not trying to, I'm not being over pe pe pessimistic, but the, the greatest danger is that there is so much uh, uh, investment uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the so called uh, war machine. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, there is no political uh, diplomatic uh, networks which could uh, seek uh, to uh, to ease down uh, the, the conflicts. And there is not much investment into uh, the uh, 
peace accords. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, this is a, a road to the big, uh, big war in Europe. Uh, and uh, it is in the common interest of Brussels, Kiev, Moscow, and Strasbourg to find such common uh, ground, to find this uh, uh, balance and to avoid further militarization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, to, to your question of who are we, the we of this, uh, of this uh, uh, panel, of this discussion. Um, several years ago at school, uh, we were, I was asked by one of the participants, when you say we, who are we? And I understood that, that, that we, we may be uh, uh, talking about different we's. It may be the we of the Europeans, of the European uh, European, uh, European Union, or uh, we the Estonians, we the Moscovites. I lived in Moscow for six years. We the uh, the little nations of Europe, and this may not necessarily be bad because uh, we all have uh, uh, flexible identities. We can't do. Uh, um, we can't help uh, um, having this uh, split uh, within ourselves. So we are not monolith personalities, uh, um, but uh, that is just uh, a reflection of human nature. Uh, I think that it is uh, hardly possible to um, uh, 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 totally define us uh, as uh, A, B, or C. Um, I think that democratization in the Soviet Union started. Uh, democratization started in the Soviet Union when people started to talk, when uh, um, uh, the boundaries between the social strata started uh, uh, to vanish. And I, while I do understand your question, I would recommend you not to be too troubled about the different identities that we all share, because after all, it is uh, useful and this. School is, I think, is a very, very good uh, um, place uh, to practice such identities. Um, uh, we are just about to, to to exhaust our time, but just a few questions from this side of the of the hall. Thank you, Indris Yusupov from Dagestan, from Russia. I have a question because of Mr. Ambassador's presentation, but also it quite re refers to the question, to the presentation by Mina, Mikhail Minakov and Zinia Svolkov. Don't you think that many of the problems you discussed have to do with this correlation between the civic and political? And that is in what the political seems to be now the um, all uh, pertaining only to the pol elites, to politically active groups. Whereas the civil society has been looking at social and engineering some projects without immediately interfering into politics. And don't you think that maybe this is otherwise? Don't you think that a solution for many problems is in the active involvement or passive involvement, if you will, but greater participation in political activity and also influence, exertion of influence? <coughs> in at least political and education, because these conflicts between populism and now radicals coming into governments, they're related to the fact that society at large is not educated enough, is not informed enough about even basic political questions or speaking directly. Many people who are active in their civic position, civil position in some social activity, but stay away deliberately from political activism and having achieved some initial level, having aspiring very much like in Ukraine, people later on would also want to give it all to the political politicians, thinking it's only their domain and which may create great problems. The same is true of Russia, judging by what Zinius said. 85% feel there are problems, but at the same time, 10% seem to be doing things that uh, only some work to defend their rights. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sergei Koshman from Kiev. I wanted to ask a question about this gap or this fragmentation, if you will, of some communicative practices that 
existed before the epoch of, uh, how should I put it, what should I call it, pre-Facebook era, if you will. Uh, as we saw it, this transformation from grand utopia to modern things, even debate about Democrats, among Democrats who say we should do something about. And this elephant in the room, and this in-between who is unmanageable, ungovernable, and it turned out that they are monopolist corporations who just pay for the services of peer spin doctors who would somehow try to whitewash their doings. This hasn't been mentioned. Where do you think you see the importance of this general or common communicative space? And going back to the norms, to which extent our norms are violated, to which extent we're indeed turned into a desperate housewives. That was a TV series. Now I feel I'm a desperate citizen who is keen to fight somebody on this big kitchen room like face, which Facebook has turned itself. So, but I realize there's no more point in going there, but I don't know where else, to, there's no other space. I stick completely to the idea that we must preserve uh, the multilateral treaties uh, in Europe. It is very important, not only multilateral treaties uh, who speak about rights, also military multilateral treaties. It's very important. If there are new problems, as Mr. Gomar says, we can add, but not to deconstruct what we have achieved. At the same time, I think that uh, one must be very clear in the assessment of the reality. Uh, somebody told about Kosovo. I don't think one can say it is bad an annexation of a province, but it is good to break up a country. We must be very sensitive on this problem. Because it can, Mr. Minakov has shown how fragmented the situation can be on the ground in some eastern parts of Europe. So if from outside, <laughs> the, if from outside there is somebody who sponsors the breakup of the country, this is, no, no, it's not me. If somebody from outside is sponsoring the breakup of the country, no, no, uh, you want to speak about metaphor, uh, nobody can translate Yes, now, now yes. If somebody from outside is sponsoring the breakup of the country, we can say it's positive or to say it's just normal. It's a new normal. The second point is, uh, Okay, it's very important to count on accountability and the accountability of the treaties. Sometimes there are also gentlemen agreements and one must be able to count on gentlemen agreements. Some of us were in Moscow when the Warsaw Pact was dissolving and it was very clear that there was a gentleman agreement between the USSR last president and the US president not to move forward the NATO borders. One can agree or not agree, but this gentleman agreement existed. And in any case, if we don't want to speak about gentleman agreements, then we must be clear to say spheres of influence are something we don't share the idea. But it's not possible that one sphere of influence moves forward and the other not. So it's better not to have spheres of influence. Otherwise, we, we come into the situation which has been very well described sometimes by uh, very keen American ambassadors who said, they are son of bitches, but this is our son of the bitch and this is all right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, yes, my name Thank is... You get both to ask. Yeah. Um, Hello, I'm Yelena. I'm a journalist from Moscow. I can see today's discussion in such a way that we're now discussing these, you know, emerging questions that require immediate attention and, re and resolution, which are very important. But don't you think we are not paying enough attention to enlightenment and education among the youth and among the children. 
well, about Russia, more or less clear. But as I was wondering, to which extent great attention is paid in your countries to this issue, and which instruments can we use today in this, given how much the technologies are evolving, given today's trends, and so on. Because in my view, this is very important, and the way we will today teach and enlighten our youth, this is what our world will be like in 50 years. Time. I'm from Moscow, I'm a journalist and I will ask in English to be shorter. Uh, so my question is about how this uh, security build up and military build up, build up correlates with the mutual trust because uh, for example, I have an example from Norway where there was a military exercise by NATO in the last uh, months. And for example, it was, of course, as the Secretary General said, it was totally defensive. But I have an example how a journalist from Norway, for example, he uh, started uh, working on a story about Russians, Russian company. Um, technology company uh, which was based and settled in the center of this military exercise area. So I mean that this uh, um, perspective and thinking which was uh, multidimensional uh, on different levels becomes uh, one-dimensional. It becomes more narrow uh, when it comes to the new security agenda. So how it can how it can live together, this security build-up and mutual trust in our societies. Thank you. And the last question, lady in white. Uh, Svetlana, Petrakova. Svetlana Petrakova from Moscow. Svetlana Petrakova, UNESCO, Moscow. First of all, I would like to use this opportunity to thank all the panelists for a very interesting for the very interesting presentation. Z. My question is for Mr. Toma Gomar. Several weeks ago, I looked, I witnessed several demonstrations in France. In Paris, they took part uh, of Paris Forum of Peace. In Normandy, I saw the demonstration of yellow jackets. Why is it that the French are so keen to go in strikes? What is it? What is it that the government of France do, do to stabilize the situation about these yellow jackets or yellow vests? Why the French are so reluctant to see the leaders of many states coming to Paris? And who are the leaders they don't want to see there at all and why? And another question for Mr. Minakov. Tell me, please, what is your take on that? What is in common between protest movements in France and Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. To be brief, it's already the uh, time of, of coffee break, but we started a little bit. Well. I suppose if we m compare it to Maidan movements with, and we try to compare it with protests in France today and what was in Ukraine, it had very little in common. Maidan has to do with civic rights and movements for civic rights. If we speak about social economic protests, well, in today's situation in Ukraine, they are rising to these moods. We see that social and economic problems in our country provoke very much the same movement. But there is no tough protest, and there is such tough um, suppression of such protests as we've seen it in France. I also would have two questions, if I may. These questions asked about civil society and education. One of the problems that we've been facing in Ukraine, when uh, in Maidan's and civic protests led to the change of regimes, was that civic educations crossed the borders borderline between civil society and what is no longer civil society and is has to do with political agenda. And this dividing line, this border has to be respected if they cross it. And the civic NGOs that have very different nature of legitimacy now go for this. They start to undermine the statehood and the order. The state has to be strong, well-developed and effective within its responsibility by respecting the rights. Yes, as a liberal, and uh, my answer to Elmira, 
I'm speaking on behalf of liberals, sometimes maybe mostly going back to the 19th century rather than 21st century in the sense of the word. Yes, well, liberals, yes, the state should not be big, but it should be effective within its scope, its legitimate scope. And the same applies to civil society. In Ukraine, I very often see civil society coming, wanting to substitute the state, and this certainly is not within normal and balance has to be first education. When the Soviet Union was dis disintegrating, Democrats and liberals left their trails, sort of, in constitutions, like articles in 15 constitution, I suppose in 11, this trail is present, which doesn't directly ban the creation of ideological monopolies. In Ukrainian institution, Article 15 bans state monopoly, and the same is true in post-Soviet states. This is a lesson of our fathers and grandfathers who lived through horrible 20th century. And what we can see today in education almost in every post-Soviet country is when they're trying to recreate ideology and education system and trying to manage national memory, it works like a new one-side ideological construct. It's a horrible process. This is the struggle and fight for the you now imagination and mindset of this ethnic majority, which usually is against individual rights and freedoms. It's a difficult process. And this is something that is promoting this national conservative process. Speaking about civic and political, then in Russia the problem is, as I say it, is that the state is pushing out people from politics on the one hand. They say, go for your, I don't know, kittens, shelters, sick kids, you name it. This is your place, on the one hand. And not only is pushing people out, but also discrediting the alternative political agenda in the sense that politics is dirty business, it's not something you need to go into, leave it for us, leave it. Because others will even be worse at that. Yes, we've got this problem, but on the other hand, as we do know, in authoritarian state, the government, the authorities perfectly realize that, that any civic activism turns out to be political, hence the law on foreign agents and you name it. So it's difficult to give a one-size-fits-all answer where this dividing line is. I like a position by Francis Fukuyama who says, if you want to change the country, go into politics. Because if you're a professor or an expert in a think tank, you will never be able to do it. So I suppose if this is, how shall I put it, if you got the gut, If you are keen on this, if you want it, you needn't fear it. I suppose you'd better go into politics and try to change it and then see how it works and whether it works. I will link um, many questions which are all very good. Um, the one coming from Italy uh, and the one coming from uh, Dagestan on, uh, uh, on populism. Well, first of all, I think Italy is very is always very interesting to be analyzed because it's very often politically a sort of uh, I don't say in English to say laboratory, political laboratory. We should remember that we had many years of Berlusconism. What does it mean, Berlusconism? It it, it is a destruction of uh, I would say traditional and smart media and the choice for pure entertainment and stupid things on TV show all the time, to some extent, to put things very bluntly. So it creates a sort of field, which, by the way, inspired also Vladimir Vladimirovich from my point of view. So before populism, the, the wording we are using, we had this Berlusconism, which has also some uh, effects in many uh, European uh, countries, in Russia also. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something to... To, to have in mind. Now on populism, I think that we should also understand that populism, in my view, is a, a tactics to get power. It's not a political alternative. Populists are belonging to political elites. You know, for instance, Marine Le Pen in France, is a, she's a pure héritière, you know. She's never worked 
You know, the same can be said for Jean-Luc Mélenchon. You know, he, he was elected many times as a senator. It's just, you know, to pretend to speak uh, on behalf of the people, just to get the power. Fine, it's a, t it's a tactic. The real issue is, in fact, are they able, if they get power, are they able to, to give back the power? And the example of Russia in this regard is, uh, is telling. So I think we should, we should understand that it's a tactics, and uh, okay, it's possible to be elected, but are they capable to get back the power? And I'm not so sure. I mean, it, it, it really depends on the, the respective uh, national political uh, culture. I'm back on, on the intervention on, on Kosovo because it was also uh, raised in the first round. I take the point you have made. It's, 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 uh, it's not to say it's good, Kosovo and uh, annexation of Crimea is, is bad. It's not at all my point, and I take the distinction you, you, you have made. Just also a reminder, what was read in Kosovo and more broadly in ex-Yugoslavia is very related to the way of functioning of the United Nations Security Council. Don't remember how many um, Italian soldiers were killed. There are approximately 100 killed French soldiers for ex-Yugoslavia. That means that also, you know, this implication to try to stop the war needs some uh, external uh, intervention. And it's also very important to have that in mind because many countries would like to have a much more important role, you know, within the United Nations Security Council. Fine, but there are also some responsibilities and ability to enforce international law. Uh, are all countries ready to do so? I'm not so sure. Are they capable to do so? I'm not so sure. So it's just to remind that it's not to say that Kosovo was perfect, not at all. There is a lot of debate on that. But to remind that there are some people who were killed, in fact, to enforce international law for the United Nations. Um, that leads also to the point coming f uh, the question coming from Moscow, uh, the link with uh, sec security, what can be done? Uh, the exercise from, from NATO. You know, I, was, I belong to the last generation of conscript in France, so I was asked to work for the OSCE, um, measure of uh, confidence, confidence at building measures. So for instance, you had many things, Open Skies Treaty, things like that, you know, the Vienna documents, FC Treaty, things like that. Everything has been almost destroyed now. All these uh, uh, arms, um, arms control agreements uh, are uh, more or less uh, destroyed Con in the conventional sph sphere and in the nuclear sphere as well. Last uh, decision taken by the USA to withdraw from the uh, uh, FNE treaty, for instance. So it's, it's really a challenge because I think we add the tools. Uh, you, you have mentioned them, but uh, they are destroyed at the time being. So we, sh we should think about the importance of OEC in this regard because that's a pan-European uh, organization and there was tool which was used during uh, two decades to try to assess precisely the military potential of the other and to try to, to, to install uh, confidence. I, th I think we should be back on that. Uh, last question and the French tradition and strikes. Um, I have no time to make you know uh, a lesson on the French political culture. It's a long history, starting before the French Revolution. You know, we have a, a word in French which is jacquerie, which is this uh, uh, sort of um, uh, popular eruption, uh, very related to our particular relation we have with the state. In France, we, there is this paradox. We do love state too much, but we do love states, you know. So very often, you have so, so, so this sort of uh, eruption. This one, from my point of view, maybe can be uh, partly compared to the Pujadism, you know, uh, in the in the fifties, because you had you had at that time it's coming from the small and medium enterprise which uh, suffered from a huge taxation, and I think it's coming from that now. That leads to very difficult situation. I think that people does not understand that everywhere in the world, and especially in Europe, the energy will be more and more expensive in the coming decades. Whatever we, we, we do, tr uh, 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 energy transition and so on, it will be more expensive. And they are not prepared uh, 
there are people to save the planet, but there are not prepared, you know, to, to sell more to do so. So that's, that's uh, the, the, the first problem. The second one is also this movement is interesting and dangerous also because that's uh, a, a movement which was made without the traditional parties, without the, the trade unions, and that's a sort of uh, spontaneous, you know, expression of uh, 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 the, the desi disagreement. Now, your final point about, you know, this yellow jackets and the Paris Forum, I don't follow you because there is absolutely no, 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 no links between the, the, the two aspects. And the people in France were much more than honored to welcome uh, all this aid of state to celebrate the end of the First World War. Yeah. I, I would just make very quickly three uh, points. Uh, one uh, on, on um, uh, the question from Dagestan. I think it, your question was a little bit different, but but uh, on, on specifically in Russia between politics and, and civil society um, and the mutual suspicion. Uh, but I think in general, this growing gap and polarization we are talking about in, in, in societies and with populism, I think those who perceive themselves to be part of the elites or the establishments are well advised to do some critical soul-searching and self-criticism. Uh, and, 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 and not to say that, you know, uh, uh, we, the cosmopolitan elites, we have the full picture uh, and expertise on everything, but also try to have a self-critical understanding what exactly uh, are the things that we maybe have missed uh, in our societies over the last uh, um, a decade or so. And the same goes for, for the public sphere. Uh, I think the public sphere will have to reinvent itself uh, in one way or another. It's a very messy picture now. I just think that uh, this idea of, of, of emotions, uh, of narratives, uh, of, of uh, relativism and po this postmodernism cannot be fought with more of the same. It has to be fought by, by facts. Uh, 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 and and not to enter the fight, you know, it it, it cannot be a symmetric uh, answer to uh, to that kind of argument. Uh, the second one on gentlemen's agreements. Um, well, uh, the, the principle there's a very key principles in the Charter of Paris is that I each country has a sovereign right to choose its own security arrangements. Um, the president of the USA can choose the security arrangements for the USA, but not for Czechoslovakia, Poland. Hungary, Estonia, or Sweden, or Finland. These are the sovereign uh, choices of our own countries. Uh, within spheres of influence, I think you, you, you cannot put, uh, uh, you know, when you put use even military force to put your political will on other countries, cannot be on, on the same level, on par with the idea that countries make the sovereign choices to actually join the European Union or NATO. I think this is a false analogy. And, and that, that leads you back to there are only the spheres of influences and we're all equally bad and so forth. If you come from a country of Sweden, uh, uh, you know, this is not uh, uh, how you would want to see the world because we know. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Um, and, and, and gentlemen, but uh, what my, my point in gentlemen can only make agreements that they have you know, the right or the mandate to, to go uh, enter into agreements. On trust and military trust, um, uh, uh, military uh, trust has definitely been deteriorating. This is because Russia, uh, Kremlin, for the last 10 years, have chosen to, in, to start military aggressions against uh, neighboring countries twice, Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, it, and it, it uses military violence. Um, uh, that now countries are thinking to terms in, in, in military defense and deterrence is a reaction to that. Um, trust can only be rebuilt by uh, uh, restoring the respect for principles, the, the, the basic decalogue of Helsinki, that you cannot use military force, you cannot use the threat of military force, uh, you cannot change military borders, you have to, to, to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other countries. Only then trust can be rebuilt in Europe. Meanwhile, there are instruments and tools uh, uh, in the OEC toolbox, like the Vienna document, Open Skies, and so forth, uh, that, that sort of specifically on military transparency and predictability. Uh, and I think th here's a huge difference. The Trident Juncture, which just uh, was, uh, uh, took place in, in Norway, uh, was a military exercise that was uh, adhering to all these tools we have. Uh, it was extremely transparent. 
observers uh, from all countries, including Russia, where they're observing aviation. NATO and Norway walked the extra mile before the exercise and during the exercise and after the exercise, informing about it and also inviting observers to So it's a very, very transparent exercise. In comparison to some of the major both announced and non-announced so-called SNAP exercises that Russia has been uh, exercising uh, basically regularly since 2013. And there are proposals on the table in the Vienna uh, to modernize and update the Vienna document uh, to be more transparent, especially uh, when it comes to military exercises and so forth. And uh, Russia has so far, so far refused to engage in this discussion. So the proposal, the toolbox is there, the proposals are there. Uh, uh, trust and confidence has to be based on, on uh, respect for the principles and equal respect for the principles. Thank you. And thank you very much to all the panelists.